Today, we remember the story of a little girl, a story that dates back to the 1870s. Now, here on this channel, we have this fascination with Fisk coffins, F-I-S-K, if you haven't heard of them before. We've done two big stories here related to people interred in these coffins. If you remember going back all oh, way a couple years ago, almost the Lady in Red at the Oddfellow Cemetery down in Lexington, Mississippi. And more recently, the story of Confederate Lieutenant Colonel William Mabry Shy down in Nashville, Tennessee. So what is a fist coffin, you ask? Well, it's a cast iron, kind of like a sarcophagus. If you saw the Egyptian mummies, what they were encased in, it kind of looks like that, of course, cast iron with glass windows. Many times just one big glass window by the face or sometimes duplicate windows, one on the top, one on the bottom. These coffins were designed to be airtight. Why? Well, they wanted to keep the bugs out, the rodents out, and they didn't want intrusion, and also to keep the diseases in. Many of these people died from all of those diseases, and as they would be transferring and transporting these coffins, and sometimes on even railway, they were afraid they would catch those diseases. So for a lot of different reasons, they would do this, and people, they were expensive people that had money that could afford it, they would do it. But what they didn't realize at the time is how these coffins would preserve these bodies in such a perfect way. In fact, as you look down through the windows of the ones that have been brought up for these various reasons, well, sometimes it's grave robbing. In this case, it was an accident. Contractors will talk about. You would gaze through the window and it was like you were at the wake of the funeral, like they had died a day or two before. Unbelievable. It was back in the episode we did in Mississippi at the grave of the Lady in Red. We were all kind of led to the story that I'm about to tell you. Now, I must give a big shout out to one of our friends here, Linda Shaldock. She is the one who initially persuaded me to do the Lady in Red episode. I wasn't going to do it. And it turned out to be, I think it's got a million views. So thank you, Linda. But she also tipped us off to the little blonde-haired girl in San Francisco. And of course, after the episode ran, a lot of comments, everybody was coming on board on that story. So I felt like we've got to tell this story. And it had become quite a topic of discussion under comments back, back in those days, a couple of years ago when we did it. Now, her name was not known when she was found. It all started when contractors were working in the basement of a home in San Francisco. What most didn't know was where that home was situated and the others that surrounded it, that neighborhood, they were on top of what was the original location of the Oddfellow Cemetery there well, well over a hundred years before. It all happened when they were digging in the basement, these contractors. They hit metal, and of course, as it turned out later, they came across this fist coffin. They brought it out, they cleaned it up, and they unscrewed the thin metal plates that cover the glass. And lo and behold, as they wiped the glass clean, they gazed down upon the face of a beautiful blonde-haired little girl with rosy cheeks and red lips. She was almost perfectly preserved in slumber, a little girl in a white lace dress. And across her chest, made of blue, blue color type flowers, these flowers were also preserved, these real flowers, as if they were just picked yesterday. She was nicknamed at the time Miranda Eve. There were people that had come together to help. There was an association called the Garden of Innocence Project. They reburied her at the Green Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Colma, and that's in San Mateo County. They were the ones who paid for it, and they also provided her with a very nice granite monument. Now we fast forward 11 months later. They, in fact, found out her real name. There was a genealogist named Elisa Davy. She was actually the founder of this Garden of Innocence project, and she was determined to find out the real story about this little girl for history. And she was the one to determine her name. 
The name, Edith Howard Cook. And the date of her death, October 13th, 1876. And she found out much more. Elisa went through thousands of burial records. She dug up old street maps of the area. She compared them with the old maps of the cemetery. And in the end, she actually found the family plot of the Cook family. Elisa put the Cook family right in these people's backyard, along with Edith. Next, she worked with an anthropologist, a professor from UC Davis. She gave him the name and the family tree. And the professor began looking for a living relative, and he found a candidate. Contacted that person, it was a man, and he was able to get a saliva sample. Now they had already taken some strands of Edith's beautiful blonde hair for DNA identification, and putting it all together, they finally were able to make the match. And it turned out that this man, an 83-year-old Marin County resident, was named Peter Cook. It all added up. They said that Peter was beaming ear to ear when he heard that he was the grandnephew of little Edith Howard Cook who'd been in the news. Well, when they did the research on the relics from Edith, they determined that she died of a disease that caused severe undernourishment. You have to imagine that she was sick, her immune system could not combat the disease, and as many other little ones from those days, young and old actually, without those antibiotics we have today, she basically probably just stopped eating and probably then slipped into a coma after a time and finally passed. So how could this all have happened? Well, if you look at the history, it turned out in the 1930s, the cemetery was moved. And everybody was moved with the cemetery except for little Edith Cook. She was left behind. And you have to wonder, and it's most probable, there were others left behind. And we've seen this, we've seen this on this channel. When cemeteries are moved, there's no one to blame. There's just no way you can get everybody. Now, interestingly, the homeowners who lived there, they told Elisa Davy at the time that they would hear little Edith. They would put their two little girls to bed and then they would hear running feet upstairs. And they would say, okay, who's out of bed? Run upstairs, check. And the little girls were sound asleep, unmoved. Happened many times, so you have to wonder, was it Edith? So let's go now to Greenlawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Colma to pay respects to Edith. Now, we won't be able to walk the cemetery on this particular episode. It must be noted there is a big sign out front showing the regulations. And those regulations say no pictures, no videos. But we were granted special permission by cemetery administrators to video Edith's grave, as long as we didn't pan around. So we respected that, and we will just focus on her monument. The original monument for Miranda Eve was replaced with this new one, and it is beautiful. It says, Edith Howard Cook, November 28th, 1873, October 13th, 1876. And the beautiful picture there, and under it says, two years, 10 months, 15 days. And that's in keeping with the custom from those days. You'd see that on the old tombstones all the time. Now there's a little verse from Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Underneath that, it says, Thank you, Team Miranda. Miranda Eve was laid to rest June 4th, 2016. Google her for our story. And lastly, at the bottom, you see there engraved a beautiful rose. 
So it is a yellow rose for Edith Howard Cook that we leave. Rest in peace, Edith. Rest in peace.